Well, this morning we were talking about how to avoid the trap of pursuing status, and I think uh, most of us, you know, would probably think, well, you know, that's not me, or that's, you know, that's, and yet we know that uh, each of us tries to hold ourselves apart in some kind of distinctiveness from others, you know, we like to maximize uh, our strengths and what people's images of us we'd like that to be real positive and 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 great and we'd like people not to see our weaknesses we'd like to hide those things we'd like to put our best foot forward and and let people see that i i think probably lots of us would would think we'd be happiest if if our lot in life included a little bit more fame you know people like hey people know us and maybe not you know, sometimes we think, well, that's just crazy. You know, we used to be concerned about being popular in high school, and that's for middle school and high school kids and stuff. But, but I don't care if people like me or not. We might say that, but I think most of us, if we were in our heart of hearts, are honest, we'd say we like, we like people to like us. We'd like to be popular, even if we're not famous. And I think most of us would say, you know, we wish our lot in life uh, had a little bit more of a great deal of money. You know, and we may have heard from people. If they say, well, "If that were to happen, then it would change us. That uh, it'd be a test of faith if you had a whole lot of money and stuff." And probably a number of you would say, "Well, that's a that's a test that I'd like to be tested with." You know, some of you like, "Hey, I'd like to I'd like to have that." But if fame is what is good, what's life all about, then we'd have to you know look at the world and said, "Then why the constant barrage of news about failed marriages in, in Hollywood?" You know, if fame is great, and that's the answer, and we'd be happy with that, then we would have to be honest about, well, obviously looking at Hollywood, we said fame is not the answer for happiness and for status and really making it. And, and we'd have to say, isn't, if, if money is, you know, the answer, and, and, and that is really what would help us, well, how many times have we seen, like, on news shows, like 60 Minutes and, and 2020 and, and things about the lottery winners who've gone on to claim bankruptcy? There's a large number of people who won the lottery who go on to, to, to claim bankruptcy with time. And so there was something they were still looking for, something still missing, and it just w- wasn't enough. And how about power? Some would say, well, I just want to feel more powerful. I want to have more authority in my life and more control over things. Yet we shake our heads at the number of powerful politicians who are in the middle of scandals involving breaking the law. And so we might say, well, I guess maybe power is not the answer because people have to go even breaking the law in order to, to get more and more. So I think if it rings true, I heard a pastor say this once, if, if you're living for fame, then when you die, your fear will be how soon you'll be forgotten. And if you've been living for money when you die, your fear will be, will be being separated from all you feel you've accomplished to be left to someone else. But if you lived in the pursuit of Christ in your life, then the scripture rings true that to live in, is Christ and to die is actually a gain. Well, we're going to read from Mark today because I believe Mark is right on here. I believe the disciples, just like us, struggled with some of the same things we did back then. Uh, They struggled with back then. We struggle with today. And no matter what you'd say about, well, I don't need fame. I don't need any more power. I don't need any more money. That's not what my life's all about and things. We know that those things still sneak in and try and grab us and try and pull us away from the things that are most important. And so we're going to see how the disciples were no different than us and how we are really not that much different from the disciples. And so uh, hopefully we're going to learn about how to avoid the traps of pursuing status and missing what real life is about. Uh, the, the, the illusion sometimes gets us of accomplishing something when in reality it amounts to nothing. And we say, well, what a waste of a life if we get caught up in that. So how to avoid the trap of pursuing status? Would you stand with me as we read through the book of Mark this morning? Chapter 9, verses 30 through 41, as we continue this expository or this exegetical teaching through the book of Mark. They left that place and passed through Galilee, and Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were. Because he was teaching his disciples, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked, 
what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said to him, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed amongst them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Lord God, we uh, thank you for preserving this section of scripture for us. We want it to go deep into not only our minds, but all the way to our hearts. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, by you changing us. And Lord, scripture is certainly part of that. Your Holy Spirit needs to enlighten these words and these truths and be our tutor and guide that it may resonate with us, that we may see ourselves in this picture and say, I'm convicted of this. I know that I don't want to be like this, but if I look at myself honestly in the mirror, that's me. So Lord, uh, let the scripture convict us, let it change us, let your spirit move in and through us, Lord, and what we preach on Sunday, help it to make a dramatic difference in our lives the rest of the week. For we know how relevant this is, not only to your disciples who struggled with these kind of things, but as your disciples in modern day America in the 21st century. So Lord, we love you and we thank you and we pray that we'd be changed by this truth today. In your name, Jesus, amen. You may be seated. So I think in this section of scripture, we're going to find at least three ways of knowing how we can avoid the trap of pursuing status. And so, you know, they left this place and passed through Galilee. And so Jesus is concerned about privacy at this point. He doesn't want them to know uh, where he is, where the disciples are, because he's taking them away to do some teaching. And what is it that he wants to get across to them that's so important? Well, here in Mark, for the second time, we have Jesus explaining to his disciples quite clearly about his coming death and resurrection. He talks kind of in the third person. They're going to take this, the Messiah, the Son of Man, and they're going to kill him. But he's going to rise again on the third day. He's pretty direct about this. But it says again that his disciples did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask. Now, grammatically, in syntax, the sentences that Jesus is saying, you wonder, how in the world did they not understand what he was saying? And so I would say it's not a problem of communication sometimes. It's a problem of our own kind of expectations of what we think Jesus, what a Messiah should be. The disciples had, again, were confused about the kind of Messiah they were expecting from the Old Testament and the prophecies and just misinterpreted some things. And then Jesus came, and it wasn't exactly what they thought. The idea of a Messiah uh, being crucified, the idea of a Messiah having to suffer was not something that they radically could accept. And so it's not that these guys are just incredibly dull. It's that, that this was just a different thing than they were expecting. And these guys, to the point, didn't understand and were afraid to ask, the Scripture says. You know, can you imagine? These are grown men. <laughs> You know, some of them have been successful fishermen. Some have been tax collectors for the Roman government. They'd been in lucrative businesses, some of them and things. These are grown men, and now they're afraid to ask Jesus some questions. Can you imagine the conversations going on amongst the disciples? Hey, Peter, Peter, ask the Lord, you know, what he's meaning there. And Peter's like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not asking. Remember last time I rebuked, uh, I rebuked the Lord, and he called me the devil. You know, get behind me, Satan. You know, you don't have the things in, of God in mind, but only the things of man. And so then Jesus or the disciples are looking around. Next, they put on Thomas. And Thomas, you know, you don't know anything at all. You can't get in trouble. Why don't you go ahead and ask Jesus what he means by all, all this? And Thomas looks back and says, oh, I doubt it'll make a difference. You know, I, I, you, know you just have these grown men with each of their personalities trying to chime in and ask the questions but it says they're afraid to ask but they don't know what he's talking about 
and they're afraid to ask. A truth that I think we need to draw out of here in not pursuing status is this first truth. Watch out in becoming so blinded by our own plans and expectations for life that we miss God's much better plan for our lives. Our plans and expectations usually or seldom will not include suffering. <laughs> when you think about your kids and them growing up and your wife and your husband, your spouse, and you think about living lives, your plans and expectations and what you dream about is probably not ever going to include or encompass suffering, is it? <laughs> and yet God uses that so many times in order to make things beautiful, to make things more like his character, to make people more like himself. Imagine if the disciples would have gotten what they wanted and expected from the Messiah. They'd perceived in their head. We've not have, we would have not have had the reality of our salvation today. Because Jesus and him going to the cross paved the way by his suffering and resurrection, paved the way for us to have the plan of redemption fulfilled for us to have a right relationship with God. That's a, a beautiful thing happened by Jesus going to the cross. And without that cross, if there would be any other way, he says that in the garden. God the Father, if there be any other way, please pass this cup from me. If there's any one person that can sneak into heaven or climb the ladder of success to climb themselves into heaven, then so be it. Let's go with that. But there wasn't any other way. Because Jesus said, you know, pass this cup for me. If, but nevertheless, Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. Well, the Father knew there was no other way but to go through the pathway of pain and suffering and the sacrificial Lamb of God. Jesus was the Lamb of God that took away the sins of mankind by going to the cross. Are the disciples the only one who have done this? Who have made Jesus or had different plans, expectations outside the ones in their mind? Or have you allowed, have I allowed pain and setbacks and unmet expectations to cloud my vision of the great things God wants to accomplish and do in my life? It's hard. It's hard when painful stuff is happening in your life. It's hard to imagine anything good at all coming from it. So even... Die hard Christians sometimes in our heart of hearts we're wondering, God, why would you allow that to happen? That was those are good people, those are kind, those are saved people. How why'd they have to go through that? John Mark Hicks, uh, he wrote the book, Yet Will I Trust Him. He talks about his son Joshua, who always uh, growing up saw the school bus, saw his other little brothers and sisters wake up in the morning, get on the school bus, and he would always shout out, I want to ride, I want to ride. Well, Joshua was born with uh, San Filippo syndrome, a uh, degenerative disorder that causes slow mental and physical de degeneration with time. And, and, and uh, the, the, the time that uh, he was old enough to get on the bus, his dad took him out there, and the first few days were fine, but then he says, for some reason, Joshua did not want to get on the bus. I took him by the hand gently and led him up the steps of the bus, and he got on, but he was whining. He was hesitant and reluctant. I thought perhaps he was just having a bad day, but as the bus drove away, I learned why he was hesitant. I heard the words that tore my heart. It was as if a knife had been stuck in my gut as the schoolmates in his class ridiculed him. The older children were calling him names. They ridiculed his need for diapers and mocked his use of them the previous day. And as the bus drove off, I could hear the mockery, and I could see my son stumble down the aisle as he looked for a seat. Anger grew inside me. All morning, I wanted to take some of those older kids aside and heap some abuse of my own on them. Let them see how it feels. Let them know what the, it's like to be hurt and ridiculed and mocked. Maybe I should talk to the bus driver. Maybe I should talk to the principal, the teachers, the parents. My helplessness increased with my frustration. Finally, I took my anger and hurt to God. I went to my office and poured my heart before him. I held nothing back. I complained bitterly, and then I complained some more. Why was my son born with this condition? Why are others permitted to inflict pain upon the innocent? Why hadn't God answered our prayers for a healthy son? 
Why couldn't Joshua ever fulfill the dreams we had for him and honor the name which we gave him as a leader amongst God's people? Why hadn't the sovereign God of the universe blessed him with health? In the midst of my complaint, it was as if God said to me, I understand they treated my son that way too. And in that moment, God provided a comfort that I cannot yet explain, but one that I still experience in my heart still today. Not only do I have a sense of the pain that the father has when his son is ridiculed, only now I can begin to appreciate the pain of my heavenly father as he watched his son be ridiculed. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to... What good can come out of pain? What good comes out of suffering? Trials. Especially when we're going through them, in the midst of them. God in his sovereignty, though, will use what's meant for bad and make it good. There is always something that's redeeming. There's always, even when we can't see it, I believe there's always something that's redeeming. Maybe even sometimes when it's years down the road. Uh, I love the story of, of, of uh, uh, Steve Saint. His story in Mali. And Steve Saint, is come, his car broke, breaks down and he's Mali, a, a predominantly Muslim country. But he, he, he finds a, a, a place, a, a shop, and on the wall it has a picture of a cross real small on, the, on this uh, kind of panoramic view of, of, of some mountains and things and it's got a little cross on it it's like wow and so he stops there to get some help at the shop and he goes in and he begins to talk to this uh, what he thought was a Muslim man named Noah Imfi Yatari and, and he begins to talk to him he says what about the cross and, and so the man uh, discloses to him that he is a Christian and he goes well tell me about that <laughs> he's in Mali and, 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 and uh, Steve Saints meeting a Christian in this predominantly Muslim nation and well this man goes on Noah y Yatari goes on to talk about how he came to the Lord and that how his family completely disowned him and considered him dead to them and, and he said well what, what inspired you to get through such hostility how did you survive and he said you know what <clears throat> I read I, I read in a magazine about these missionaries that were down in Ecuador that had weapons and, and things with them but they didn't use them and they actually allowed the people that they were witnessing to uh, uh, about Christ to actually spear them to death well Steve Saint at this point realizes they're talking about the five missionaries that were with Jim Elliot one of them was his dad Nate Saint who years later as he's broken down in the country of Mali he's meeting a man that came to Christ because of the sacrifice that his dad and those missionaries did with Mr. Jim Elliot what man wants for bad God will often turn around and use for his glory and eternal significance will come out of it I think sometimes we're just too impatient to see what God is doing. We want things now. You know, the Israelites and different things that happened, would, it, it would happen in the framework of 40 years. You read through the Old Testament, after 40 years, then God moved to different direction. After 40 years, then God did this. And, you know, as human beings, we're like, that's too long. I don't have that much time. But God's timing is not our timing. I, I had a conversation with my oldest daughter, Allie, and, and she was talking to me about some friends. And I said, you ought to invite him to church. You ought to share the gospel with him. She said, Dad, those kids, that kid will never come to know God. It's just that kid's no, there's no interest there at all. And, and I will tell my daughter the story about my friend Brian in high school who I had spend the night with me one evening. I decided to stay up all night sharing the gospel with him. Because my friend, his, his, his parents had divorced. He was a, an angry kid already. He became even angrier after the divorce. And he turned me down. Even after I shared my heart with him, we were good friends. We were best friends at that time. But we begin after that point to come apart. But I continued to pray for him. And I told my daughter, Allie, 20 years post high school, my friend Brian, who I thought would maybe never come to know Christ, his anger and bitterness and calloused heart, gave his life to Christ 20 years post high school thinking that he's never going to do it. And this is Brian, <laughs> who we were playing doubles and tennis with some guys, and Brian, they're kind of giving him some trash talk, and Brian hops the tennis net and goes, the next thing I know, he's got the guy's neck pinned down to the bottom of the tennis court. 
like, Brian, don't kill the kid. Now Brian's the Springfield Police Department taking care of the bad guys, I guess. I, mean, I, would, I would fear him still today. But he knows Jesus. And sometimes we just think, wow, what could come out of all this bad in this man's life? What could come out of this? But the Lord wants us to, to do something that encompasses suffering. And our plans and expectations are not going to be always what we think we wanted where we get something much better than part of God's amazing and miraculous plan comes to fruition. Moving on, verse 33, as they came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. <laughs> you love that, you know? Jesus, he's walking ahead of his disciples on the road to Capernaum. He's walking ahead, you know, maybe like a, a duck, you know, a duck with all the ducklings behind him and the disciples are bringing up the rear and he's listening. He's always in tune to the conversation that's happening behind him. And so it's not that he just doesn't know it. He doesn't ask these questions just for the fun of just, he, he already knows what they've been talking about. And so it's funny that they are completely silent. And the irony can't be missed here. The irony can't be missed here that Jesus is walking to Capernaum and he's just shared with him about how he's going to the cross. He's just sharing about the Son of Man is going to be rejected and killed and then arise on the third day. And he's talking about the greatest act of sacrificial love that humanity will ever know. And the irony is his disciples are behind him talking about who is going to be the greatest. Jesus is talking about sacrificial love and laying down your life. And the disciples are talking about how can we take over maybe when the boss is gone. Maybe we're going to be, who's going to take over for him? Or maybe, of course, they didn't understand completely, so maybe it wasn't quite like that. But they're talking about, hey, who's going to be large and in charge? Who's going to be on his right hand and his left? They don't want to speak up because they're embarrassed. You know, imagine them just recently they'd been on the mountain of the transfiguration you, you, you wonder if Peter, James and John you know they maybe leaked a little information to these other nine disciples maybe kind of saying hey we got to go to the transfiguration you know the other disciples listening to that well I've been to like two transfigurations you know I've, I've been to a couple of those already and you know, and, and like, then they're thinking, what's a transfiguration? <laughs> yeah, but, but you know how people talk in our offices. Why didn't I get picked? Why did I get passed over? Why didn't I get the, the promotion? Where's the fairness there? Where's the equality? That's not right. How many times do we kind of just look around? That's not right. And the reason why we're saying that's not right or that's not fair, or that's not equal is. Because we didn't get picked. We didn't get chosen. We didn't get that. And if we would have gotten that, and other people were passed over, other people didn't get that, well, that would be fair. Right? So these disciples, we know we got to go to the transfiguration. Well, we got to do this. We got to do this. And so the second point I want to make about resisting the make your life about status is we need to be careful not to get sucked in to the world's pattern of self-promotion, of jockeying for position. Because this will eventually almost always end in embarrassment and disappointment. Whenever we're about demanding our rights and, and the world and life is all about us, it always usually ends in embarrassment and disappointment. His disciples were embarrassed when they got caught thinking only of themselves. And we should be embarrassed about the same today. Allow ourselves to be truly treated like a servant. You know, Christians so many times we say we, we want to be considered a servant of the Lord. But none of us ever wants to be treated like a servant of the Lord. I wrote down some different things. They could be subtitled. I didn't put these in your bulletin outlines or anything. But they could be subtitles about why. Why not to get sucked in the self-promotion and jockeying for position on our way to making our life about status? Why? Well, I said I just wrote down one. It's not a true reality. 
We're just mere mortals, brothers and sisters. We know him. Psalms 103 talks about we're made but nothing but, but out of dust. And he knows how weak we are. We can read about how weak we are. We have no reason for, for pride. We have no reason for like, wow, we're really something. We're just all those brothers and sisters of dust that God was fortunate and, and loving enough to breathe into our nostrils some life into us. There's a dating website called OKCupid okay that revealed how thousands of its users had answered one particular question in a survey to measure partner compatibility. And the question simply was, are you a genius? Two out of five people in general answered yes. And amongst men, 50% of men answered that they were geniuses. Now, the scientific definition of genius comes down to about being in the top 98 to 99 percentile. So, obviously, there is a great problem or something that's not adding up when 50 percent of men say they're geniuses, but scientifically, 98 to 99 percent, you have to be in that top 1 or 2 percent to be a genius. You can see the math's not adding up. We usually just laugh at people who know they think they are really smart or really great. I'm thinking, no, no, no. This is not reality. Another reason we've got to watch for that self-promotion is when you think you've arrived, when you're at the top of the hill, you need to know the only place to go from there is down. It just makes sense. If you think you're at the top, or you think you've arrived, you have no place to go but down. There's nothing more, no other place to go. We talk to these haughty, sometimes arrogant people and things, and they think, oh, they're just setting themselves up for a fall. And Scripture even says that. Pride cometh before a fall. It's scriptural. That there's no place to go but down. I was, I was uh, looking uh, at, uh, I was watching uh, some football games the other day, and, and uh, John Cheeks, he's the football coach at Washington State, and he said what everybody else has observed time and time again, his football team was undefeated, and they were looking, at, and, and it's about the time the sports team is just feeling great, and their practices are going well and stuff but they start to take it a little bit easier and John uh, Cheek says this he says usually midway through the season is when we begin to see all these huge upsets of undefeated teams who begin to believe all the baloney about how good they're how good they are and then you see about midway through the season upset after upset after upset and the media will say wow bedlam pandemonium look what happened this weekend well what happened is whoa we are so good and then the work ethic went out the window. Everything that got them where they were on their way to disappeared. I could give one illustration. Being a coach <laughs> in athletics, I could give one illustration. I'll give you one more. The Katie soccer team, just 7th and 8th grade. She's a 7th grader. And this year, they were undefeated into the 4th game. Feeling good about things. And you could already see a little bit of the attitude of some of the girls and a little bit more squirreliness, not listening to coach quite as much. And, oh, what is coach, does he really know what he's saying? He's really knowing him, trying to get him to run hard, trying to get him to go full still. And we lost that fifth game to South Eugene. And the girls, just like this after the game, in my mind, I was a little bit like, yes. Why would a coach, why would a coach do that, say that? Because I'm thinking, you know, I want this. I told this team at the beginning of the season after watching them after the first game, I said, you guys are good enough to be champions. You're good enough to be champions. It's going to be all about your focus and how you're going to play this year. And, and I knew that what the whole biggest thing would be is if I could motivate them. Well, so they lose that game. And after that, after that one loss, the whole rest of the season, I was able to say, there's going to come a championship game, I think, for you guys someday. And it's coming towards the end of the season, and it goes through South Eugene, and they beat you. And so they're working really hard right now across town. They're doing their best, and they're fully going after it, and they're, they're, they're getting it done. And if we, we want to beat them, and, and so sure enough, I kept on telling them, and we get to a championship game, and we're playing South Eugene. And our girls win 2-1 to one in the championship. And I would give it credit to game number five's loss and getting him there. The only place when you're at the top is down. It's almost harder to, it's harder to coach the undefeated team. It's harder to coach the person in life that feels like they've already arrived. Jesus says this in simple terms. He says, you know, it takes a great, a great sinner to make a great saint. 
It's not the haughty, it's not the arrogant, it's not the people that feel like they're already morally pure that need a savior or acknowledge and know that. Sometimes it's harder to win a person to Christ that's actually a pretty good citizen or, you know, they're not the ones that feel depraved. They're not the ones that know they're completely full of depravity. Well, the most important reason is God is against those with it. James 4, 6, if you're in a self-promotion and jockeying for position, you need to know God is against it. James 4, 6, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. We need to be different than the proud, arrogant ways of the world. If we're going uh, to, to not fall in the trap of pursuing status, we need a new vision from a new heart. Only with a new heart. We need to be different than those that fall into the world. So, you know, of looking at the, looking down on others and constantly grading other people. And verse goes on, so sitting down. In verse 35, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed amongst them, and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So Jesus sits down to a place of teaching. Begins to teach in simpler ways. You know, earlier in Mark, uh, he said a, a term that says, If anyone wants to save his life, he will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and my gospel will save it. You know, that's a pretty concise statement. But here, Jesus always gets simpler and simpler to help us understand. So now Jesus just says this time, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Those phrases are saying this, the same thing. But Jesus, in order to help his disciples comprehend and understand what he's really saying about how to live our lives as believers, as followers, he encapsulates the things that's most important right here. If we would live like this, we would not be able to keep the people from knocking down the doors to get into the church today. But the outside world is not convinced that Christians are like this. They think that Christians are like this. <laughs> but if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. So he takes little Johnny in his arms amongst the disciples. Here, bring me little Johnny. He says, whoever welcomes one of these little children welcomes me. Well, why, why does he say that? Well, see, in this, this culture and things, sometimes in today's culture, we'll say kids are running the, the schools, they're running society. And things. In this culture back then, kids had no status at all. Kids had, had, had no really uh, status in that culture to no voice, no prestige, no ability to carry their own load. They were taken care of by the parents, taken care of by the rabbis, taken care of by people, no, no way of paying you back. And Jesus is saying, these are important to God. They can't pay you back. They can't give you something back. You just need to, to love them. You need to take care of them. You need to look out for them. It was a different way of life, a different way of seeing things. And so here's the truth I want to get across. Begin today to embrace a new counterintuitive pattern of following Jesus in sacrificial service, which welcomes in the blessings of God. He said, if you take care of these little ones with no status, for no reason, but just that you love them, that's, uh, that I've told you to take care of them, then you invite in, you welcome me, and you welcome in the blessings of God. I say counterintuitive because people in this world are born in the sin. We're born in the sin. Each of us is in a state of the natural mankind. Carl Jung and all those other philosophers and that say mankind is naturally good. I, I can do nothing but laugh at that. And I would laugh more if the consequences of them being wrong wasn't so overwhelmingly awful. As I read the papers, as I watch the news, I can't believe the world's philosophers that the education system is based on can say in good conscience that man is naturally good. I just, I won't even apologize for that. It's scriptural, and I can look around and say that is obvious. We were born in the sin. There needs to be a change of heart. There needs to be something counterintuitive 
that comes in and redeems mankind and begins to change us from the inside out because left to our own device, left to our own nature, we were going to hell. No part of the world, no part of our society is untouched by the obvious repercussions of our selfishness. Not government, not marriage, ethics, morality, family, schools, friendships, business, the church, everything can only be explained by the Bible's truth that we've been tainted by the fall of mankind way back. The Holy Spirit helps us supernaturally to embrace though another concept, another way when we accept Christ. And we can be filled with Him. We can be filled with thanksgiving and joy, which is key. I believe thankfulness is such a key to resisting our natural inclination to demand our rights, our natural inclinations to demand status and things from this world to try and fulfill us. Only through a different perspective, a transformation of the mind and the heart because you are so thankful of what Jesus has done for you and what he's doing in your life today. Imagine you're a billionaire and you have three ten dollar bills in your wallet and you get out of a cab and you hand the driver one of the bills for an eight dollar fare later in the day you look and find there's only one ten dollar bill and you realize either you've dropped one of your other ten dollar bills or you overpaid the cab that money in which you feel like he's stolen from you what are you going to do? Are you going to get upset? Are you going to go to the police and demand that they search the city for the cab driver? Or are you going to go back to that walkway and, and look and see if find where you might have dropped the $10 bill? Are you going to be mad, upset? I don't think so. Why? Because it's $10 and you're a billionaire. That is the very dynamic at work, I believe, that one that's come to know the glorious riches of Christ in the inheritance you have in Him. Once you know you have that inheritance in Him, how could you be concerned? How could you be down? How could you be upset? How could you be wanting status from the little things in this world when you have all of that in Christ? You're blessed extravagantly beyond what you can imagine, beyond what we can fully comprehend. And with this joy, and when we comprehend at least a little bit of how loved we are, of how taken care of we are, we can pass that on. We will want to pass that on to others, won't we? To meet the needs of others, to be a joy, to be something others are thankful for. And yet, this is still harder to do than said. I'm not saying any of this or preaching any of this today without, uh, with any kind of naiveness that once I share with you this, then we'll become less petty and less pursuing of status because I know it's foreign to us. I know it's not the way the world operates and we are in the world still. I can just look at verse 38 to the end of the chapter and get an idea of how hard it was for disciples. After Jesus has taught all of this to his disciples, everything I've just taught you, this is the next verse in verse 38. You've got to love this. It helps us feel better about ourselves. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because, why, why, why? Because he was not one of us. That's so telling, isn't it? And what does Jesus tell him? Do not stop him, Jesus said. For one, no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. So the disciples, he's not one of us. You know, uh, uh, even with our imperfect vision, though, I would say Christians are making a difference. Even the way the Lord is working us, and we don't always fully let Him fully work through us, but even with an imperfect vision, 
some of that vision that has landed on us and we've walked in and talked with him through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is blessing our world through us. And I'm seeing that. One, look, I just saw this article this week about what Christianity has done for the world. Eradicating slavery. As the Christian faith spread after the fall of Rome, the practice of slavery dwindled. Centuries later, when slavery reemerged, Christian advocates like the Mennonites, the Quakers, and individuals like William Wilberforce strongly opposed it. Opposing infant, infant side, uh, infant to side, and infant exposure. Abandoning infants was a common Greco Roman practice until Christians led reform to outlaw it in, in the fourth century. Eliminating gladiatorial games, the brutal sport which used the death of slaves to entertain the masses, was condemned by Christian activists. Building hospitals and hospices. Unlike most Greeks and Romans, the early Christians organized resources to care for the sick and the dying. Elevating women's status and rights. Although women have been mistreated in nearly every culture, Jesus treated women with profound respect. Early Christians routinely protected women and children from neglect and abuse. Promoting higher education, producing great works of literature and philosophy, creating beautiful works of art, sculpture, architecture, establishing modern science, composing brilliant music, advocating human rights and concern for the poor, creating a worldwide multi-ethnic community. I could go on and each par a paragraph about each one of those things and how that was done. When we just get a glimpse and hold on to a glimpse of how the Lord has taught us to live, it makes a world of difference. The Lord has changed us, but He wants us, just, just as He was trying to teach the disciples, about no, 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 it's not just all about us and this little group. And sometimes even pastors and churches are insecure about even, you know, ministry's got to happen only through us. And what a bottleneck that would be cosmically if the great sea of Gentiles and Revelation spoken about that are in heaven had to come through one ministry. But instead, Jesus says, no, no, keep releasing. Keep on touching. Keep on doing. It's not just about us. It's about him. It's about sharing that love of Jesus. At this time, we're going to uh, celebrate with communion this great fact that Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins and resurrected to newness of life. And he teach, taught us all kinds of great things like that the first shall be last and the last shall be first and if you want to be first you need to be the greatest servant of all what a difference that one concept would make in all of humanity today if we would just live by that one concept that the Lord tried to teach his disciples thank goodness when we don't live up to that and we 